So you getting into this industry, into this field, that's not by accident, I'm assuming. It's not by accident. I believe it's by purpose and design um, for, for my life. Um, and, you know, like no one in my family, myself included, no one is surprised at who I am today. You know, no one's like, wait, Aisha? Like, not, not that little. Um, you know, I, I mean, this is, this is who I was as a kid. I was a kid and I talk about it. And I've talked about it on podcasts and, and in my book. My mom sent me to a Christian camp when I was, um, when I was a kid. She sent me with 200 bucks. I was probably 13 or so. And our responsibility, housing was taken care of. Our responsibility was to pay for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for five days, plus trinkets, souvenirs, whatever we, whatever we wanted to get. Um, she sent, sent me with $200, and I came home showing with $175 after five days. So <laughs> in, in, in five days, I spent only $25. Spent $25? Listen, ain't nobody get a T-shirt, no cup, no magnet. You get nothing. I came home $175, put it in the shoebox, and slid it under my bed and was like, we rich out here. Like, yeah. so, <laughs> So I've always been like, I've always been extremely money motivated, which at the same time, um, you know, for, for a poor kid in the hood um, is, is a gift and a curse, you know, because when, I mean, you're from New York, I'm from Philly, um, back in the day, like the wealthiest people that were in our community, and again, I was driven by money and wealth, the wealthiest people in our community that we saw, that we knew personally, they were drug dealers, Correct. right? So, you know, I'll never forget my first job was at McDonald's, um, which was in, in South Philly in, in, in my neighborhood. And I'll never forget, like, me and, me and a friend, we cooked up a plan. We were going to, I was, because I, I, I'd saved my paychecks. I was going to buy the weed. She was going to distribute it at the school. We had a whole, we had a whole little, form, like, a whole plan <laughs> mapped out. Um, and I'll never forget, again, this is privilege. This is, this is the privilege I'm talking about. So, again, poor kid, single mom, teen mom. But, again, I'm talking the privilege I had. My mom came in my bedroom and was like, you know, I don't know what's going on. Whatever you're thinking about doing, don't do it. Like, and, and I hadn't told anybody in my family that would have told my mom, right? She comes in my bedroom one day. She's like, whatever you're thinking about doing, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Like, it's just all, like, basically, it's all up in my spirit. Like, whatever you're about to do, don't, don't do it. And, you know, I, like, I, I'm, you know, I'm 16, 17. I ain't going to act like I know what she's talking about. I'm like, really? What? What happened? Who did it? <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and when she left, I, kind of, I just sat there and kind of thought about, like, this could be one of those moments that defines my life. And I truly believe that it, that it, that it was. I mean, because whatever I do, I go all out. You know what I mean? Like, like whatever I do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I, listen, I would have been the best drug dealer in Southfield. I would have been a Griselda Blanc. I would have took the whole country down. <laughs> Everybody would have been on crack rock eventually. Like, you know, I'd have been, I, so, you know, whatever I pursue, I'm going to pursue it to the, to, the, to the fullest. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm not going to do it. You know what I mean? Because just her coming into my room, and, 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 I, and I still don't know, and I've mentioned this on several podcasts, I don't, I don't know if I've actually told her this, this story, but I truly believe that that was one of the defining and pivotal moments of my life. So I think that there were so many different things that aligned and happened and were orchestrated just by purpose and design to get me to, to where I am. I mean, Sean, even, um, even going as far as... Um, my very first boss at 16, he was a, he worked for a franchise owner. And, and back then in South Philly, it was a wild, wild west. He had franchise owners that were doing things illegally. I was, I was 16 in high school working probably 45 hours a week at work. Like, you know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> I come home, like straight home, like change, hit McDonald's. I'd be working there till close and I'd work all weekend, like totally illegal for a 16 year old. Right. So the, the guy who was a general manager of the store was a big, like six foot five dude. And when I tell you, Sean, he used to cuss us out. Like we were grown men. I mean, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm 16, and I mean, you drop a hash brown, he is part of my French, he in your ass, like, I will you up in here, like, so, you know, and, and I, I rem I'll never forget the first time he did it, and I'm like, yo, like, I went to the coat room, I cried, I'm like, I could either tell my mom, right, and she gonna make me quit, um, or I can, like, suck it up and get back out there, like, I this is $4.25 $4 an hour, that's good money, like, I need this money. So, um, so I, I did, I sucked it up and I, and I got back out there. And the reason I say that, and, and, and that's abuse. I mean, like, you know, that, that's, um, it, it ended up being, again, by purpose and design in my life, because as a new stockbroker, as a young stockbroker, if you've watched any movies on being a stockbroker, one of the very first things that you do, if you've ever seen the movie like Boiler Room, for example, you're literally at 22 or 23 in a, in a bullpen or in a room of other new stockbrokers and you're pounding the phones. All you're doing is calling people over and over and over and over again. And you know how it is when you get telemarketing calls. And back then, there was no caller ID. We're talking late 90s, early 2000. There was no caller ID. 
So people weren't, you know, people still had home phones. Some people didn't even have cell phones. So you could reach people, you know, when you're, when you're dialing at night. Um, and I was just dialing for dollars. And people used to rip me a new one on that phone. And, and keep in mind the experiences that I've already had. At 16, I'm being cussed out in my face. By, you know, I'm five two. I'm being cussed out in my face by a six foot five big dude, like who's bending over me, telling me there is there's not a thing you can tell me on this phone that's going like so. You you, you want these mutual funds or not, sis? I'm trying to help you. Out. Like <laughs> there, you you can't cuss me out effectively enough to um to to convince me that like I I need to stop doing what I'm what I'm doing. So you know, again, all the all the various things um, that have happened in my life were, I believe, instrumental in in getting me to to to, to just where I am. And I didn't I didn't have I didn't know any stockbrokers. You know what I mean? I, when I went to when I first went to Temple, I was heavily influenced by um, the movie Boomerang. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm about to apply to college. Boomerang was in my late teens, one of the most popular movies out there. And I remember that was one of the first movies where it wasn't like black exploitation, like black exploitation. We saw black people like getting it. You know what I mean? Like Marcus Graham had a penthouse. You know what I mean? Like they had right. like, everybody was wealthy, was getting it. And they were all in advertising marketing. So when I applied to Temple, my very first major was marketing, just because I'm like, all right, but, like black people can apparently get it in in the ad space. So let me let me I'll do that. Um, and then I remember like just going along and I, re I remember having a, a lot of enthusiasm in my finance and my economics classes and then literally bumped into a friend, asked her what she was going to do after college. She had an interview with, at the time it was American Express, they had a financial advisors division and I'm like, well, give me the number, let me call the manager and see if I can get an interview as well. And, and that's how I ended up being a stockbroker. I, you know, it, it's crazy because you, you hit on so many great points. I could pull out 50, but I'm, I'm zoning on one because I do this every single chance that I get. Trust the process. Trust it's it. As simple Trust as it. that. Trust it. Yep. Trust the process. Yep. You, you talking about being a 22-year-old stockbroker, cold calling people, getting cursed out, but you were prepared for it from the most unlikely of places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, here you are, this young girl, being cursed out by a six foot five boss of yours. Yep. Literally gave you the tough skin and the tenacity that you didn't know one day was gonna come into play and Absolutely. allow you to be successful in your chosen career. But what that man did to you, abuse in a hall, prepared you for when you sat down on those phones. And like you said, there wasn't enough cuss outs. There wasn't enough hanging the phone up in your face. There wasn't enough people going off on you that could keep you from doing the job because you were already prepared for it. So right. whatever you're going through, trust the process. Trust yep. me when I tell you, I cannot emphasize this enough. God does not randomly put you in situations they are all designed purposefully divinely that will one day help you in your future so whatever you're going through the bible always says in all things give thanks just give god thanks even if you don't understand it. yes sir what's up guys thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video truly appreciate you if you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.